so the last thing about conifers is that they don't all have these woody seed cones. Um, we tend to think of conifers, and the name conifer literally means cone-bearing. But if you grew up in the southern hemisphere, that may not be your perspective, because down there, there's a large diversity of conifers that have fleshy cones, and those cones are often highly reduced to where there's not much there. Um, but we're all familiar, hopefully, with junipers. Juniper berries that are used to flavor gin. Um, juniper berries look like berries, they're called berries, but they're actually just fleshy cones, just like the seed cone of a pine. But the cone scales are fleshy and coalesce around uh, just the whole structure. And if you take them apart, you can see that they are cones. But there are some conifers like the yew, genus taxus, which is an important source of taxol, which is used as a treatment against ovarian cancer, one of the more economically important conifers medicinally, that uh, basically just has um, a naked seed without any obvious vestige of a cone. And, but it's clearly a result of reduction of the cone and secondary presentation of the seed in a way that's, that's attractive to birds. So it's an animal dispersal situation. And these fleshy conifers, fleshy fruited, or not fruited, fleshy cone or fleshy seeded conifers are animal dispersed rather than wind dispersed. So conifers have diversified a lot in terms of their dispersal mechanisms, and that's especially true in the southern hemisphere. All right, so now we're going to move on to the flowering plants, which have a number of major innovations that uh, we think are responsible for their incredible evolutionary success. And again, like the well, the genosperms are somewhat debatably a clade. We often talk about the five major lineages of seed plants. These are all seed plants because it's a bit uncertain whether those four lineages of genosperms really do constitute a clade, but there's no dispute that the flowering plants are a clade. They're diagnosed by many, many molecular and morphological characteristics. And in fact, it's a bit uncertain how, to, how they relate to the other seed plants, even the fossil seed plants. Darwin brought this up back in the 19th century that the origin of the seed plant, or the origin of the flowering plants is an abominable mystery, is what he called it, because they just seem to burst into the fossil record near the end of the Mesozoic, long after these other four major groups of seed plants, these genosperm groups, are evident in the fossil record. All of a sudden, in the Cretaceous, uh, around 130, 140 million years ago, they seem to just take over the fossil record. The genosperms go from being everything in the seed plant record to being a relatively minor part of the seed plant record. And the angiosperms really basically take over. And there's a huge diversity of angiosperms by about 100 million years ago. Um, it's not quite as much of a burst as it looked like when Darwin was talking about it back then. There's been a lot more fine scale uh, dissection of that fossil record. And we can see progressive evolution of a lot of modern lineages successively during that time. So that's been the one thing that we have worked out. And the, or the or I should say the um, branching order, the phylogeny of the modern angiosperms, pretty well understood now. But exactly how they evolve, these unique characteristics that they share, as a group that are probably responsible for the success is another question that hasn't been answered because we don't have good fossil intermediary stages for a lot of those traits. All right, so flowering plant diversity is off the scale compared to the gymnosperms. Remember, the gymnosperms are less than 1,000 species. We have well over 300,000 species of angiosperms. Um, it's not even certain. It's, it's, we, the, the, ranges range, the range of estimates is really plus or minus 100,000 species because they're still being described, uh, especially in the tropics. But even here in California, we're, we're constantly describing new species. Um, so it's, it's really a diverse group. And the morphological and ecological diversity is just phenomenal, too. It's really off the scale in terms of what we see in other land plants. And they're really much more diverse than all the land plants put together, the bryophytes, everything. So, so we have to really ask the question, why are they this diverse? And the first place to look, obviously, is the flower, because that's something that they share that we don't see in the other seed plants. So let's have a look at a flower. And this is just a super, super simplified uh, perspective. A flower is basically just a cone, a very simple cone. It's really homologous to the pollen cone of a conifer. It's just a, a stem axis that bears multiple whorls of parts. And they're typically four whorls. A whorl is just a, an arrangement of parts, three or more parts arising from one point along an axis. So we're only seeing two here, but typically in flowering plants, we have three or more parts to a whorl, and they're typically four whorls. Um, whorl is spelled W-H-O-R-L. It's um, the outermost whorl is called the sepals, and then we have the petals, just the interior, the stamens, and the carpels. And this inner node, the node is where appendage is attached to a stem. Um, so these are nodes, and these are what we call inner nodes. Inter nodes separate nodes, and in most flowers, these inner nodes are almost completely collapsed, and so these four whorls are basically right on top of each other but they are just very slightly separated. So we have these two outermost whorls. This is the base of the, where the stem attaches to the rest of the plant. This is the summit of it, where it terminates. Um, the two outermost whorls are called sterile appendages. Um, they don't produce uh, reproductive cells. And then we have the fertile appendages up here, the stamens and the carpels. So even though this is sort of idealized and simplified, we actually do have some fossil plants that look something like this. And this is an example. This is an artist's reconstruction of Archifructus, which was originally touted as a Jurassic angiosperm. That would have made it the oldest angiosperm ever recorded. And it made the cover of Science Magazine several years ago. As the paper was in press, Another look at the stratigra stratigraphy revealed that it was a Cretaceous angiosperm, so they had to publish a retraction. But they got two papers in Science Magazine, which is the most prestigious magazine, so sometimes that works out anyways. But anyways, here you can see the flower. And there aren't any sterile appendages that were preserved here, but we do have stamens, and we do have carpels that replace vegetative leaves along this axis. So this gives you a nice perspective that really a flower is just the reproductive shoot apex um, of a flowering plant. And it's determinate, though. Once the final carpel is produced here, it's not going to continue growing. It has a determinate growth. That means it terminates after development reaches a certain point. Whereas a strictly vegetative axis of a, of a, um, of a, of a uh, seed plant would continue to grow indefinitely. So that's Archifructus. But this is a more typical looking or cartoon flower here, where you can see the sepals and the petals, the two sterile appendages. Now, the sepals may not appear to have much of a function at this stage, but during the bud stage, before the flower opens, the sepals are protecting the contents of the flower from herbivory and from other environmental conditions. Um, and they often do have protective outer coverings that are tough, maybe have glands on them, sticky glands or, or hairs, things that protect them. The petals. Um, are often more delicate, and they're often brightly colored and are serve as an advertisement or attractant to animal pollinators. So 
We'll talk a lot more about that shortly. So when we think about pollination, before we get into it in more detail, one of the important things to consider is that um, when we look at the advertisement of a flower, or in this case, this is an entire inflorescence that's highly condensed into really a false flower. Each one of these what look like petals here are actually flowers. It's an unusual case in sunflower family. But we see something like this, and we just assume that's what the pollinator sees. And it's a trap that botanists can fall into. But if the pollinator, for example, is a bee, you've got to think like a bee and realize that in this case, bees, which are the most important pollinators, animal pollinators with flowering plants in general, um, their visual spectrum is shifted towards shorter wavelengths. So they don't see very well. The reds and oranges look like black to them. They don't really see those longer wavelength lights that we see very well. But they do see in the UV end of the spectrum that short wavelength end. And this is the same um, sunflower inflorescence photographed without the UV filters included. And you can see this bullseye darkened area, which is the bee view of that um, inflorescence. And that allows it to orient towards the business part of this inflorescence where the pollen and nectar are going to be found. So that's an important thing to consider. All right, so now we look at the, we'll look at the, the, two, the two fertile appendages, the stamen, uh, the stamens here. The stamens don't look much like leaves. Actually, each one of these four sets of appendages are leaf homologs. These are um, modified leaves, which is not so hard to see in the case of sepals and petals. It's a little harder to see in the case of stamens until you look at some diversity of stamens. Most flowering plants have stamens that have a filament, a stalk, that attaches to the fertile part of the stamen, the anther. And inside the anther, we have the microsporangia. They're going to be producing microspores that, become, that germinate to become pollen, which is the male gametophyte. And pollen in flowering plants comes in a huge diversity of forms. In, uh, animal pollinated plants typically have these more sculptured pollen grains. And we'll get to that again in a moment, whereas we have smooth pollen grains here in wind pollinated flowering plants. But even uh, taxonomically, you can tell a lot of closely related plants apart by the, the pollen sculpturing or lack thereof. And this outer layer is really resistant to decay because of the sporal pollen that we see in the earliest land plants and even in some of those green algae that were closely related to land plants with regard to the zygote covering. And so this preserves really well in the fossil record. And there are scientists called palynologists who are experts on pollen that are mostly looking at the fossil record and can work out the taxonomic composition of plants through time. Um, peat bogs that I mentioned earlier that preserve plant remains often have really rich pollen fossil records too. And these palynologists are really becoming more and more valuable as uh, climate change becomes a bigger and bigger issue through time. All right, so finally we have the outermost fertile appendage, the carpels. In this case, just one carpel is evident here. So the carpel basically um, contains the ovules inside of it. So this is different now than in all the gymnosperms that had naked seeds, seeds exposed to the environment at some stage. The ovules are enclosed within the ovary of what's basically a leaf homologue. The carpel is a leaf that's been um, fused along its margins into a container, which is the basis for the name angiosperm. Uh, container seed or vessel seed refers to the carpel. Um, now, more than one carpel can fuse together into a structure that looks like this. So um, through evolutionary time, we can have multiple carpels fusing together. And so there's another term that we often use called pistil that refers to the structure that has a, a stigma where the pollen germinates, a style where the pollen tube grows down through, and the ovary, which is the container that includes the ovules down there. So that's known as a pistil, regardless if it's made up of more than one carpel or just one carpel. And um, this is the most distinctive feature of flowering plants. So if you're looking for a fossil angiosperm, if you can find evidence of a carpel or a pistil, then you basically demonstrate you have a flowering plant. And that's what we don't find before the Cretaceous, no evidence of carpels. It's um, a real mystery. But there are some stages that we can see in living flowering plants that may be progr evidence of progressive evolution of stamens as well as carpels. And here on the top, we have the stamen series. These are evolution presumed evolutionary changes from going from a leaf-like stamen with the, the um, pollen sacs here. And then we go, you know, laminar just means leaf-like. So a leaf-like stamen, it gets progressively um, less and less leaf-like until we end up with something where we have a distinctive anther and filament. And we do see stages similar to this in some uh, lineages of flowering plants that represent, especially some of these early branching lineages. Now the development of the carpel is a little bit more idealized here. This, we don't see anything like this in modern um, flowering plants where we have a leaf, a basically two-sided leaf that has ovules born along its margins. But we can infer that this stage existed at one point because we do see some stages similar to this and this that are less typical looking carpels. We don't have an obvious style, for example. And we can infer that this sort of stage is the result of an evolutionary change where the margins became, the, the whole thing became um, enrolled, the margins basically fused along their edges, and then eventually we had a complete containment of the ovules inside of this enclosed structure, the carpel. And there are some stages similar to this in some of the um, earliest branching lineages of angiosperms where the tip of the carpel is only fused by secretions, sticky secretions, as opposed to actual union of the tissue itself. So this is what we infer. And again, carpel is the most distinctive flowering plant feature. Any questions about that? Okay, so a few terms. Inflorescence is just, I mentioned that word already. And that's basically just a flowering stalk. So a flowering stalk that produces one or more flowers is an inflorescence. And you can see some of the diversity of inflorescence forms. And these are not only important taxonomically because different groups can have different forms of inflorescences. Um, they're also important in the way that pollination and dispersal can take place in some instances. That is, they can influence the way that a pollinator visits flowers and can affect the rates of outcrossing versus um, inbreeding, for example. All right, so let's talk about pollination and fertilization now in flowering plants here at the end of today's lecture. Um, so here we see a pollinator. So unlike in gymnosperms, now pollination in angiosperms is not the delivery of the pollen to the ovule itself, but the delivery of the pollen to the stigma. Of the, of the carpal or pistil. And so remember, this, is, this pistil is sporophyte tissue. It's not um, the phenyl gametophyte. And one of the interesting things about this kind of delivery is that pollen grains, they have to germinate on this, this uh, moist substrate on the stigma, but the, the sporophyte tissue here exerts some selectivity on that. So the sporophyte can prevent the germination of these pollen grains by an antibody antigen-like reaction. 
it's not, unlike those kinds of reactions occur inside of our bodies when a foreign substance or foreign organism comes in, which is recognition of non-self and attack of non-self, in flowering plants, if the pollen grain is from the same individual, there's often this antibody antigen reaction that limits inbreeding. So it's an attack of your own pollen and the prevention of your own pollen from getting down into the, uh, from growing down to the ovules. Or a close relative, it could prevent, for example, one of your sibling, siblings from fertilizing your ovules. So that's, um, that's some selectivity that's exerted by the parent, the sporified parent of these female gametophytes that protects them from inbreeding by male gametophytes that are too closely related to them, for example. Also, you can imagine that at this stage, you can have male-male competition, so they have to grow down here to reach these female gametophytes, and it's a bit of a race between pollen tubes to reach female gametophyte and their eggs. Um, so we can also have some competition here, which could result in some higher, uh, result in some natural selection for individuals of higher fitness. So those are some things that flowering plants do. And also, um, yeah, again, the pollen, is the, the sperm is being delivered directly, like in the gymnosperms, to the egg, so there's no need for, for freestanding water again. Um, but anyways, we have this indirect um, pollination where the pollen is actually deposited far from the ovules, and that has some real consequences in terms of who can actually fertilize the ovules. All right, and so next time we'll get into some mechanisms that actually prevent self-fertilization. Those were a couple of things, but we'll talk about that in other mechanisms in more detail. And uh, have a great holiday weekend. <laughs>